Hello. I hope this is working well. I'm trying a different microphone to see if there's a better uh, sound quality for you this week. And um, yeah, thank you for joining me. Thank you for coming. It's good to be with you again. And um, I'm looking forward to talking to you about our favorite topic of languages. It's uh, always a pleasure to have you with me. And uh, so I really appreciate you coming. And uh, yeah, and so today there's a topic that I've chosen to talk about. And there's a bit of a backstory behind it. So I want to kind of go into why I want to talk about who speaks the most languages. Now, I can imagine that a number of you are thinking, what on earth is he doing <laughs> talking about these things? Um, because clearly, um, yeah, talking about who speaks the most languages, it can seem like a strange question to ask. It's actually a very common question. So first of all, let me just sort of preface this with pretty much every single interview um, and every single person I speak to outside of the language community asks the question. So do you speak the most languages in the world? Who speaks the most languages in the world? Or a variation on that theme. And it's, it, it's a question that comes up a lot. <laughs> and the truth is that it's, um, it's not so straightforward. So as you can imagine, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, who speaks the most languages? And how many languages can people speak? It's another question that sort of goes hand in hand with with this idea of sort of human capacity, right? And I think it comes from the idea of this sort of competition that people tend to feel the need to have of to be the best at something. And we have things like, yeah, um, you know, the Olympics and different things where sports uh, people, athletes um, and different people in the sports arenas get together and compete to win uh, gold medals, silver medals, bronze medals, and so you know your first, second, third, who are the best ones. And you get this a lot with um, with a lot of uh, subjects as well. So you have spelling bees uh, in the US, they're very, very popular. You have um, a big competition, for example, that, that with different countries as well that speak the same language. So in the Netherlands and Belgium, they have this spelling competition to see who are the best spellers of Dutch. The, the Belgians or the Dutch, and it's it's quite an interesting uh, thing that as humans, it's a, I suppose it gets us a natural thing, right? We we do like to sort of strive and compete, and and it sort of pushes things forward. Now, there's no from, from my point of view, there's absolutely no harm in asking that question, and um, I think it's a it's a valid question for people to ask. So I would never sort of ignore the question, and in fact. Um, it was interesting that a couple of days ago, I was tagged in a post on Facebook asking exactly something like this within the language community. And I thought it's probably a good place to start from uh, with this topic. So the question from the Facebook group where I was tagged in was what polyglots or people who are sort of in the community think of in the sort of language learning community, I mean, we're all we're all together, right? And we all have opinions. But what sort of people who have maybe been quiet on the topic think about a man named Ziad Fazar? Now, for those of you who don't know about Ziad Fazar, let me just give you the backstory to him. He is originally from Lebanon, and he grew up, I believe, in North Africa, and then later went and lived and is now currently, I believe, in Brazil. Um, now, Ziad Fazar speaks uh, a number of languages, obviously, from, from all that time. And in his youth, um, this is quite a long time ago, the Guinness Book of Records wanted to find the person who speaks the most languages. Now, they decided that, that would be Ziad Fazar, and they published uh, a book of Guinness World Records with Ziad Fazar as the person who speaks the most number of languages. Now, what happened after that was he was invited to speak on a uh, TV show in Chile. And he went, it was um, Viva Lunes is the name of the show. And he went to speak on it. And uh, according to Ziad, he didn't really know the complete format of the show. Um, 
there are clips that float around the internet and and come up every now and again and they were definitely a topic of conversation uh before sort of youtube and facebook and twitter and instagram and all the social media was was a thing really so on sort of the community um forums and it was it came up as a topic on the how to learn it in the language forum that used to be the place to go for sort of language enthusiasts now when Ziad went on the show and um, bearing in mind he was doing the entire show in Spanish on Chilean TV um, Spanish not being the language uh, of his day-to-day -day life he lived in, he lives in Brazil it's not the language of um, his origin he uh, grew up I believe speaking uh, Arabic and French and um, so he was doing a, a TV show through Spanish which is already a pretty cool thing to be doing right now what happened was they brought in people from the local embassies and consulates is how i understand it and they had them in the audience and they asked some questions to ziad in their respective languages and when he went to answer them um he didn't always give the the appropriate response seemingly uh, to what people were asking now, there are many, many things that can happen on TV and in interviews. So people can edit things to make people look uh, more intelligent or less intelligent, that the answers are, are good or bad or whatever. I don't know if any of that happens, so I'm not even going to comment on, on that. I just know that that is something that can happen on TV, so we, we always need to keep a very open mind. Um, seemingly, he didn't understand certain questions or things that would be assumed as basic. One of the ones that, that sticks out to a lot of people is uh, what day is it today it was asked in Russian and he, he didn't answer the question appropriately. Um, so <laughs> when after after all of this sort of it was sort of a, a big scandal and, and uh, I think it was based on this kind of thing that, that um, the story that the Guinness uh, World Record books actually retracted this category of person who speaks the most language in the world, because clearly it wasn't an easy thing to judge. Now, Guinness, the Guinness Book of World Records is normally very diligent about how they assess people and things. Now, assessing many languages, well, that sort of number of skills is very, very difficult. What I can say about Ziad Fazar is that um, he himself in his own words said that he learned and spoke was it 57 or 58 languages and he wrote in I think it was in his book he a passage of it a quotation that I saw said that he had, had said he'd learned uh, most of his languages between the ages of 17 and 20 which is clearly a three-year period <laughs> and to learn that many languages to sort of a, a level where you could speak freely and easily um, would be uh, very difficult and actually I'd say probably impossible. Uh, I, I've not personally met somebody who can do that. So uh, immediately for me there would be bells ringing in my head of I, I don't know how how possible it is to do that. Um, unfortunately for Ziad as well, um, the way he came across to people, this could have been how it was edited in, in the TV show. Um, and then that people didn't respond very positively to um, the way he, he he spoke about his ability. And I think partly because from his point of view as uh, a devout Christian, um, he was saying it was a gift from God. And he said that in a way of it's not on me, it's it's on God. And, and so from his point of view, this would have been something he'd say um, knowing uh, Christian people as, I, as I've done throughout my life, it would have been a way of saying basically all praise to, to God and this isn't, this isn't just me, a mere mortal, this is because uh, I've been given this, this ability and, and um, I'm very grateful for it. That's what he would, uh, I assume, mean by that. However, the way a lot of people have interpreted that uh, is uh, he thinks he's, he's special and and it, it comes across as arrogant. Um, there were a few things where people did it, assume that about him. Um, and again, I, I don't know his personality. Um, I have reached out to him to see if 
I could talk to him just because another person who loves languages. And um, unfortunately, he, he, he wasn't very responsive to that. Um, and I think he, he basically wanted um, an exchange of, uh, of money to be able to do that, to have a conversation. So um, that wasn't something that went forward. Although I do know other people who have spoken to him directly. And um, clearly he's, had, he's been through a lot with the, the adverse media. And they said he was a very nice person. And, um, and so all I will say about Ziad Fazar in response to that thread and in response to sort of talking about the person who speaks the most languages is that clearly he's a very uh, accomplished language learner in that he speaks a number of languages that we have seen evidence of to a very high degree. So he, he clearly speaks Arabic, he speaks French, he did the interview in Spanish, he speaks Portuguese, and he also spoke English uh, pretty well. So there's at least five really good languages there that we've heard. And, and so I don't want to take anything away from that. I think that's pretty impressive. And it could well be he's, he's looked at and studied a number of other languages, and they're just not used very often. Um, however, then printing that in a place like um, Guin the Guinness Book of Record, World Records, is a very difficult thing to quantify. And as you as you just sort of heard now from uh, the story I've, I've relayed to you of what happened, you can understand that it's to the point of being difficult that it actually just broke down as soon as uh, someone brought him on TV to to test him. Now, the there are a number of people in the language learning community, uh, a number of them who have been on television and appeared in books. Um, I myself am one of those people. And uh, I, I will sort of say that whenever I've been approached by a number, well, not every single one, but a number of uh, journalists and uh, people who want to write stories, they always ask how many languages you speak. Uh, they ask um, you know, if you, if you think you're the best and uh, and they ask things like that. And I find things like that are very, very difficult to answer. So this is why I always say I've studied probably over 50 languages. I, I don't keep a track of the languages I've studied. Um, I can obviously write them down, but I don't keep a, a track of them. Like they're not they're not sort of MMs or or Pokemon that I collect and sort of want I need to catch them all. Um, I've simply studied some languages because they're related to other languages I speak. So the number, yes, of course, it goes up, right? I mean, just if you think of the Germanic, Romance and Slavic languages, um, you're already getting towards 30 languages just with those three groups. And that's without going to sort of your Albanians and Turkishes and, and Chineses and Japanese and, and, and who knows what that you study, right? So. People just seem to add and add and add to this number. But what that doesn't mean is I speak all of those languages really, really well. That's not what that means. That means I've looked at, studied, and uh, gone into the grammar, gone into the vocabulary of these languages, not all with the same um, plan or idea or focus. And many of the other people I know in the language learning community who have achieved quite uh, re quite good results. I mean, when I say quite good, that's in a very British way of saying it. It's extremely remarkable results with their language learning. Um, they've done similar things. And it doesn't mean that you have to speak them all particularly, you know, all particularly amazingly well um, to, to say that you've studied a language or that you have notions of a language. I mean, there are many people like this. A um, good friend of mine, Tim Keeley, has studied a number of languages over his lifetime. He would be the first to say, yeah, of course, to speak them all completely flawlessly and perfectly is, is, a, is a very challenging thing. Um, when I asked this question and I put the note out that I was going to talk about this today, I asked sort of who speaks the most languages. And I'm very flattered that a number of you said that you think I might be that person. And in fact, I, I, I would never say that myself. And um, and the reason I would, because I, I, I don't actually believe it's a possible to find out. Um, or, or be true. I think that there are a number of people who who are very, very good. And I'll tell you why I don't think it's it's an easy thing to answer or or that can be true pretty much for anyone. We can we can pretend that we know, 
but there are a number of reasons. And that is, as soon as you mention that you are the best at speaking languages or you speak the most number of languages, the problem is, is that you'll always get somebody come out of uh, somewhere and say, but my uncle uh, Roger, actually, he spoke more languages than you. Um, or my auntie Betty, she was amazing. And actually, the languages you speak are all very similar. Whereas she spoke, um, she, she spoke Greenlandic, Finnish, um, Georgian, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, French, and maybe Swahili, right? She spoke nine languages, but they were all very different. So that's a lot better. And then you'll get somebody else will come out and say, actually, my granddad Joe spoke 10 languages and they were all at like a C2 level. They were amazing. And then you've got to sort of decide what do you do? Is it number of languages regardless of how much that you know? Is it the amount of words that you measure? What do you measure and how do you measure it? It's, it's extremely complicated and convoluted. Now, there was, uh, many years ago, a competition, polyglot competition. And the person that won that is a person called uh, Johan van der Waller uh, from Belgium. He is um, a specialist in Turkic languages. He uh, teaches uh, those languages, in fact, in Belgium. And he's spoken at the polyglot conference on two occasions. And he's not just an impressive uh, language learner. He's also uh, a lovely, lovely person. And he's, uh, there are clips of him speaking these languages. His Turkish is, it's insanely good. It's really, really good. But he also speaks a number of other languages uh, to a, a very good degree and to a high level. So he is officially the person who's won this competition that used to exist. Um, another person who's, who's really good in this kind of category and was in the same competition is Helena Badzi, um, originally from Greece, uh, now lives in the United States, and she has also spoken at the Polyglot Conference and is also an incredible uh, language learner and um, learns languages to a very high level. And there are a number of people like this. There are people that kind of fly a little bit under the radar. Um, there's there's uh, Yanis, who some of you also mentioned, who is originally Greek and works, uh, I want to say, the European Commission. Um, and, and he is also, he's learned a number of languages. He studied many, many languages. Also very, very impressive person. Um, Emanuele, Emanuele Marini, also somebody who flies quite under the radar, really, um, in terms of the language learning community. Uh, but he's appeared in in some things in, in Italian media, uh, particularly. And he is also someone who is extremely impressive to speak to and can really communicate very, very well um, to a very high level in a number of languages. Um, Vladimir Skorteti is, is, is more well known. He um, also can communicate in a number of languages to a high level. Uh, Judith Meyer for me is uh, an impressive person when it comes to learning different languages and, and really delving into them and, and setting her goals and her mind to a lot of, to, to achieve some really cool things. Um, then you've got Lydia Makhova. Uh, Lydia, uh, I mean, she she actually was interpreting in a number of languages, extremely impressive uh, individual. Uh, you've got people like Robert Bigler, who again is not really, um, very, really prevalent in the language learning community at this at this time. He came and spoke at the very first Polyglot conference, an interpreter with amazing language skills. Um, and then also you have a lot of the other people that you've mentioned, Professor Alexander Arguelles, whom I've had the pleasure to spend a lot of time with and can communicate very well in a number of languages, read books in a number of languages. I mean, these are people that are, are super impressive. Um, Alex Rawlings, uh, Luca Lampariello, um, I mean, there are so many, I could go on and on, Studio Raj, there are so many that speak a number of languages and speak them well, um, that, you know, I, I couldn't name them all. Uh, a number of you also mentioned Lindy, Lindy Bortas, of course, is, um, is, a, is a, a wonderful language learner who shares great journeys with the languages, and it's extremely impressive as well. Um, so there are many, many people who are prevalent and not prevalent in the community. I'm aware that there are other people who actually are not even sort of in media or mentioned, um, who also have really, really impressive abilities and languages. And I know you're out there and 
I, I, if you're watching this and you or you happen to be uh, sort of in, enjoying sort of sort of watching from the outside, e even if you just reach out to me, I would be very very happy to to hear from you because it's it's always a pleasure to sort of speak to people who are really motivated and inter interested in languages. Now, the very first time I did an interview uh, actually was with Collins uh, Dictionaries and. They reached out to me uh, in the UK many, many years ago after my very first video on YouTube in 16 languages. And uh, the question they asked me was, um, do you think you're the most multilingual person from the United Kingdom? And I said, I have no clue because I've not spoken to everyone in the United Kingdom to be able to answer that question. Um, anyway, they, they kind of went away and then they came back and they said, well, we've looked around and we think you possibly are. Would you be happy to be called that? And I said, um, have you spoken to everyone? And they said, no, but we've spoken to a lot of people. And I said, well, I'd be happy to be labeled as one of the most multilingual people from the United Kingdom, because clearly that's not, not a huge jump for me to make. But um, to say I am the most, I, I find just a little bit, for me personally, too much. They, they wanted to say that, but I, I personally didn't. Um, and so I've always shied away from this kind of competition, because first of all, for all of the reasons I've given of, it's very, very difficult to say why one person, one individual is the best at languages. Um, and also because I think it, it can be a dangerous game to play in terms of someone else will come along and they can just say, well, actually, no, I speak the language you speak and more. And that, actually, I, I would say that I, I would be very happy to meet more people who speak a lot of languages and different languages to the ones I speak. And that would be wonderful to see people improving constantly. The other thing that people do talk about are um, historical figures. And it's always interesting, I find, when you talk about the topic of the number of languages that people speak, often the ones that speak the most languages are dead and have been dead for centuries. And, and so there are no recordings of them speaking any of the languages. And so there's actually no real evidence. It's a very interesting thing. I think that is partly to do with the fact that, um, yeah, uh, urban myths become very popular and get repeated. And it's amazing how people can repeat things over and over again. That's not to take away from the, the real achievements that many of these historical figures uh, would have had. I mean, Mezzofanti may have been an amazing language learner. I have, I have no doubt that, 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 that he would have been. Um, where, where my kind of doubts creep in are the fact that I've met many, many people who are very, very good at languages now, including people who have learned languages in short periods of time, like Daniel Tammet, who went to study Icelandic and um, was there for just actually not a week, but four days studying with the teacher whom I also met and spoke to at length about Daniel and about his studies. and. He did go on TV after four days of study of, of study of Icelandic, and he answered questions. Again, there are videos on YouTube. He spoke about it at the Polyglot Conference in Reykjavik. And I would encourage you to have a look at that. Um, of course, he, it's a Germanic language, first of all. So um, it's not uh, it's an Indo-European language. So it makes it a little bit easier to do that, I guess, after four days than, than say, others. It's still an impressive feat. Um, but I've spoken to so many people like that but I've never met anybody yet who can truly speak freely on any topic in the kinds of numbers that you hear spoken about people who are dead, um, like Emil Krebs or, or Metzofanti. Um, we're talking, you know, numbers of in excess of sort of 50. And I would say that if we're not seeing it now, it is very difficult to sort of imagine that at a time where you had even less ability to travel, to talk to people from different countries and to um, and and to sort of get materials, written materials, it feels like it would be a lot more challenging um, in that period to speak that number of languages to that level. Um, so, yeah, it, it does feel like it, it would be difficult. So are there limits to the number of languages a person can speak? Um, 
I would say I don't know what, if there is a limit, I don't know what that limit is. I would say that that limit is uh, a lot to do with how much time you've got available. So if you're able to not work and just devote your time in your day to languages, maybe you can create a, a timetable that allows you to learn a lot of languages and and do a lot of things with your languages um, during your work, during your day, right? Um, there, there is obviously a lot that needs to go into that. First of all, if you've got a family or if you have to, you know, if you have other things that you need to do, immediately your day is reduced in terms of the number of hours you can spend. You then have to wake up with the mentality and the motivation every day to study languages and to do exactly what you're saying you're going to do. So are you realistically going to get to that sort of level and practice them to that degree to keep them all active? Mm, possibly quite difficult. Um, I think that 25 to 30 languages is, is doable um, in terms of being able to communicate quite freely. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's amazing, right? It's great to be able to do that, but I wouldn't be so surprised by that kind of number. Um, I think when you get to sort of 50s and 60s and, and, and more, um, that's where things start to kind of break down, I think. Um, be, just because of the amount of hours you have in your day and the amount of contact you can possibly have with 50 languages. I mean, just sheer maths, okay? Sheer mathematics of the hours available to study. So this is why I prefer saying the number of languages you've studied and not the number of languages you can speak and then appear on Viva Lunes in, in Chile and then be uh, left in a complete mess because um, it looks like you've not been truthful or it looks like um, your claim has been exaggerated. So I would say, that's kind of where I stand with this idea of who speaks the most languages and how many languages you can speak. And um, I hope that giving you a very frank and honest view from my point of view has been helpful. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start looking at the questions that you've been asking and, and what you think. Um, as I say, uh, this for me has been something that I get asked quite a lot and I yeah, really find it um, for all of these reasons, this has taken me 30 minutes nearly to just get to through all of the information sort of floats in my head, that's floating in my head about this topic. Um, so yeah, uh, there we go. <laughs> so feel free to ask any questions. If you've got some that I may have missed, feel free to let me know. Um, let me just go to the top and see what I have here. Um, yeah, I love that you've got um, some of your mentions of the people we've, we've got here. Uh, Saran Portuguese. Uh, now, oh, desculpe, eu falava somente inglês agora, mas outro dia eu, eu posso fazer alguma coisa em português também. Tá bom? Um, let me see. Thank you for your well wishes. Yes, I'm doing very well. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to see. Yeah, the numbers game. It is, it is a numbers game, right? Um, uh, Okay, uh, the guy. Yeah, I, I can see some of you have seen the um, the the video of uh, Ziad Fazar. Uh, my heart goes out to him really because he he has got some good abilities. So I I wouldn't sort of be be too um, yeah too hard on him myself. How you? I'm pitifully and woefully watching Luca's live stream and yours too at the same time. Oh, Luca and I are doing a live stream at the same time. Well, Luca's gonna be way more popular than me. <laughs> there we go. He's a lot prettier than I am. And um, also he, he does have quite a few followers. So yeah, I mean, I'm, and I'm sure Luca's gonna be coming out with some great stuff. He's a great guy. Um, let's see, uh, what's the most languages anyone has obtained and maintained at C1 level or higher in your experience? Difficult to say, Shane. Um, so first of all, you have to test and people would have to go in for testing for the C1 level. So I know Emanuele Marini, for example, has done the C1 level or C2 level in, for sure, in Greek, in Polish, in German, I think he may have done. If he hasn't, he's got that level. Um, I, I've spoken to him in German um, and in Polish and in Greek and in uh, Serbian 
his Macedonian's really, really pretty good <laughs> as well, and he can communicate without any problems. He also speaks Bulgarian. He also speaks Slovene. I believe he's got a qualification that's equivalent to kind of a, a C1-ish level in that as well. Um, he also speaks, let me see, what else? I can remember them all. Turkish, and his Turkish is pretty good. Um, and I mean, he can communicate freely uh, when I say pretty good. So you've got to be at least B1, B2 level to be able to communicate quite freely in the language. Um, and then also Albanian. Um, he also speaks um, Arabic. Um, I don't know how well he speaks Arabic. My Arabic isn't good enough to be able to assess that. Um, and then obviously his native Italian, um, Romanian. Um, he's also studied a number of other languages. He speaks Farsi as well, speaks Persian. Um, I think he can communicate quite well in that. Um, he speaks the Scandinavian languages so he can, when we went to Norway, he was communicating in kind of a Swedish, Norwegian mix, a bit like me <laughs> when I try and speak. But yeah, I mean, he speaks those. He's, I think he speaks Dutch as well. But he speaks a number. He speaks Spanish, I think. Um, he doesn't like speaking English very much. So I've never spoken to him in English. We only ever speak... Normally when I speak to Emanuele Marini, we speak in um, Serbian or, or Macedonian, or a mix of the, the two. Uh, we have spoken in other languages when we were in other countries. So we were out together for a night in, in Poland, and we spoke in Polish with, with the other people around the table. And similar thing in Albania and... Um, I don't think of in Greece, maybe. And uh, the same thing goes for for Vienna when we met in in sort of Austria or, or Bratislava. I can't remember where we were, but we, we spoke in German. Um, oh, and he also speaks Hungarian as well. He can get by in Hungarian fairly well. Uh, but yeah, he's he's pretty impressive. I don't know anybody else who's done so many of the exams. I know Luke has done some of the exams, and he's planning to do, I think, the next the C1 or C2 exam in Polish as well, but he's already done the C1, C2 exam in French and Spanish and German, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken. So Luke is pretty good with those kinds of things. Um, and I would say that probably there are a number of others that, that have kind of reached those levels, but I don't know who's done the, all of the exams. They're the ones I know. Um, I do know that Lydia, for example, has, has studied a number of them to a high level because she had to interpret them and that's that's already like a C1, C2 level that you're talking about to do that. Same with Robert Bigler. Um, yeah, what's the mode? Okay, let me see. Um, okay. Um, okay, let me see if I can see any other questions here. Um, okay. How much vocabulary is similar between German, in German, English, and French? Can you make a, um, a comment? Um, so English has English has most of its um, Latin and vocabulary from French, from Norman French, in fact, and um, about sixty percent or more of English, probably more than sixty percent of English uh, vocabulary is of uh, in common with French. Um, whether it all means exactly the same is, is a different question. Um, and then with German, I'm not sure with modern German, but obviously most of the rest of the English is Germanic. Uh, so you're talking probably another 35 to 40% of the language is Germanic uh, in terms of vocabulary and stuff. So there would be a lot of lack of crossover. A lot of basic words in English tend to be the same as in German or very similar. So things like the parts of the body, for example, are very Germanic. So, um, yeah, like Nase, nose, uh, mund, mouth, um, Ellenbogen, elbow, hand, hand, finger, finger, nagel, nail, um, yeah, was noch? Ring, finger, ring, finger, <laughs> ring, yeah. These kinds of words are very, very similar in, in German and English. Um, and then but I'm not sure what percentage it is exactly. It's um, an interesting question though. Um, but yeah, that's tends to be what it is. Like words like milch, milk, these kind of wasser, water, all these kinds of base words tend to be German and English. And so you get quite a lot of those. It's a bit like this, the sort of thing that you see with the Slavic languages. You have about 1,800 words 
in all of the Slavic languages that are either the same or very similar. And they tend to be the base words like uh, milk, um, bread or similar things, water, those kinds of things tend to be either the same or very, very similar uh, in most of them. There are exceptions, of course, so it's not all the same, um, but that's kind of how it works. Hey, Richard, you inspired me to learn more languages. That's fantastic. Great to hear that, Lucas. Um, I can already speak German, English, French, and I have um, mandatory Latin at university now, and I want to learn Italian. Yeah, we're very, very good. Um, and you're very welcome. Thank you for, uh, for letting me know. It's always nice to hear when people feel inspired uh, because it kind of validates the need and to talk about languages for me and makes me feel that something's going out there and doing something good. That's it's always a nice feeling. I think like every human being, right? You you want to have some sort of validation for, for what you're saying and what you're doing. Uh, it gives you sort of pleasure and it gives definitely gives me pleasure. So thank you, Lucas. Um, and good luck with your language study. Um, let me see. Okay. Besels majarul, ej kijit majarul beselek, nen nen yol, no, 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 I'm saying, okay, nem yol, nen najon yol. I studied, I studied some Hungarian a long time ago. I did a, a sort of a challenge. It was very basic Hungarian. I did the this challenge. It's on my on my YouTube channel somewhere where I sort of did the Pimsler challenge to learn some Hungarian. And it was a lot of fun, but it's not particularly good. I'd love to get to it at some point again properly and actually study it. Um, which Germanic language um, was the hard hardest for for me to learn? Um, What's the most difficult romance language, in my opinion? Okay, so it depends where you're coming from. Uh, but for me personally, in terms of the hardest romance language, I think in terms of speaking it well and picking up all the vocabulary, all things being equal as just a monolingual English speaker, the hardest one would probably be Romanian because it's the furthest away. Um, then in terms of romance languages, then for... To write, though, French is pretty hard to write correctly, even for French speakers. Francophones have terrible difficulty writing the language well. They have the same kinds of issues that English speakers have. Spelling is terrible, um, have problems getting the grammar right, um, all sorts of issues like that. In terms of the Germanic languages, I would say that um, probably living with Germanic languages that are hardest, probably Icelandic or Faroese, just because they've got a more complicated case system than, say, German. Uh, I may say that Faroese might just be Icelandic in terms of being a bit more, a bit trickier, and that's simply because of materials available, um, whereas with Icelandic, there are quite a lot of materials to help you learn Icelandic. Uh, with Faroese, that's a lot harder. Um, and also the pronunciation of Faroese is a little bit, I think a bit trickier than Icelandic. Um, maybe that's just me because I've been exposed more to Icelandic, I don't know. Um, I spent a week in the Faroe Islands and I studied it before I went. And um, yeah, my, my Faroese now is like almost non-existent. Um, but uh, it was it was an interesting experience. I really like the language. I, I just think that yeah, in terms of living Germanic languages, it's probably one of the most, that and Icelandic are probably yeah, almost hadn't, had, head to head in terms of difficulty level from a native English speaking point of view, um, monolingual English speaking point of view. Um, let's see, English and French. Yeah, I've got that company. Yep, okay. Qui es das violi velo en Esperanto? Mi volo si tu vi las tempe povis practici via en Esperanto. Mi povis usi gin en la gaderingo, sed mi tuta ne usas gin en Macedonio. Mi ne havas ocaso, mi ne havas grupon chitie. Char mi mi povas usi Esperanto, kai paroli gin kun ale ai homoi, kai mi trechatas la lingua. Mi pensas ke gi estas pli facila lingua por mi lerni la la vortojn kaj tiel plu, ĉar 
li havas la la esperanta lingvo havas ankaŭ um multajn um uh, francajn vortojn uh, kaj ĝi estas pli facila por mi ĉar mi parolas bone la francan um sed mi mi mi, mi devus ankaŭ diri ke mia esperanto ne estas uh, perfekta la mia mia nivelo mi havas ankaŭ ankaŭ kelkajn problemojn kun la gra, la gramatiko uh, ĉar mi mi tendas ankaŭ uzi um, kon, konstrukcioj uh, konstrukcioj uh, ol la itala lingvo uh, kun uh, mi 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 volos uh, diri la mia problemo ĉar uh, mi mi sies ĝi ne estas korekto sed mi volos diri tion uh, ĉar mi parolas pli bone ankaŭ la italan um, espereble ĝi estas bone por vi vidi mian nivelon en esperanto uh, dankon <laughs> um how many languages can you speak around b2 level it's difficult to say even that to be honest sometimes because i've i have have studied some languages to that kind of level and then i'll be communicating quite freely and then i don't use them and it kind of goes it goes in ebbs and flows kind of as i was saying which is why it's very difficult to sort of do this and sort of get into that numbers game and it's why i tend to avoid the numbers game as well uh personally i just find that if i say that and then and then someone speaks to me and they want actually no you don't speak it this is why i always say to people i'll speak the language with you and if you think that i speak it great and if you don't great and it doesn't really change anything because studying a language isn't about somebody giving you this validation of you're amazing or, i mean obviously it's nice to hear that kind of thing if someone says that you they think that you speak a language well but the really weird thing is one person will say that you speak a language well and you'll go to the next person they'll say oh you're terrible at it or you might just have an off day you might have a day where all of a sudden your head your head hurts you've been speaking another another language that's interfered with that other language and it's amazing how how these things really affect your ability to reproduce language i mean it's just a natural thing right it's it's quite strange um oh thank you sam saying that i'm in this person i really really appreciate that you started learning hebrew last year and it's amazing to immerse yourself in a new culture yeah hebrew is really cool as well because um in terms of i mean a semitic language right hebrew um but it's weird because obviously the way the way hebrew has been put together from modern hebrew from um the sort of the the biblical hebrew um is quite an interesting thing because clearly the speakers of of modern hebrew they, their sort of ancestors spoke uh, normally yiddish or ladino or russian or some other uh, local languages right um and then they 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 arrived and they had to to start speaking to each other in this common modern hebrew so a lot of the constructions feel quite european so it's amazing how quickly when you start learning a language like hebrew whereas with arabic for example you start learning arabic and it feels like it takes you forever to reach this very basic stage of just communicating basic ideas whereas with hebrew you actually jump quite quickly from um saying a few words to saying sentences um and i think it's because of that imitation of of some european grammar uh constructions and um, let's see i like that yeah there are some uh, agreements here on some of the things i'm saying about uh, romanian um okay mal gucken um, ich habe gerade was auf Deutsch gelesen und jetzt denke ich auf Deutsch, aber es war ja keine Frage. Entschuldigung. Um, mal gucken. Move to Japan. Uh, okay. It's cool that you, I like that you're all communicating on this as well. About um, what do I think of Walter? Walter actually, Walter and I did a conversation. So when Walter reached out to me the very first time, he was interested in me in us doing his typical kind of video, talking in lots of languages as many as possible. Um, I'll be honest and say that that doesn't really attract me to uh, making a video. I don't feel like I really need to or want to make a video in as many languages and say just small snippets in lots of languages for the sake of doing it. Um, I don't think it's, for me personally, I don't think I need to do that anymore. Um, and I'd, I'd rather have a more meaningful conversation about language learning. And also it's something he's done with a lot of people. So when we spoke, we actually had a conversation in, 
in a smaller number of languages, but we actually have quite a long chat in those languages. I mean, we spoke for over an hour. I think the video is actually shortened. Um, but what I will say about Walter is that he speaks and communicates in the languages I spoke to him in, he could speak and communicate and understand me um, in all of them. Um, so if you if you go and find that video and see it and you're interested in sort of how we spoke, you will see that he, he communicates quite freely. And, and I mean, and he's actually a really nice person. Um, I've met him in person as well. And um, he, he's very friendly. He's very approachable. Um, I enjoyed speaking to him uh, for that video. And, um, and I'll speak to him again in the future. How is Korean going for me? Thank you, Shane. Um, really, <laughs> really, really slowly. Uh, so Kore <laughs> Korean is is like, I, I feel like I learn a gazillion words. I said a gazillion. Let's say like 20. I see like 20 words maybe, right? And then I think I've remembered things. I think of ideas and then I come back and I'll see them in another context and they've gone completely out of the window. It's it's incredible how quickly they they go in one ear and out the other. What I will say about my Korean is is that slowly but surely things are making more sense and um, and I'm definitely reading things now uh, that are on sort of other social media streams and I'm not just reading it and like reading it out because I can pronounce the, the letters because I've learned the alphabet. Now I'm starting to actually understand some of the things I'm reading. This is still very basic, though, very very basic. So it, this is a long project. I think that probably in a year, for, just for a year isn't enough. It's probably going to take a lot longer than that. And now I've made friends in the um, Korean language learning community. I absolutely want to carry on and, um, and continue to improve my Korean. One day I hope to go back to meet with um, uh, Professor Alexander Ogwellis and his lovely family and uh, use Korean, that'd be so cool. He, he asked me actually about my Korean a few, about a month or so ago, we spoke on the phone and um, and he, he asked me how my Korean's going and I said, it's not there yet for a conversation at all. Um, but I, I, I look forward to the day where I'll be able to say to him, okay, let's, let's have a chat in Korean. I'm sure he'll enjoy doing that with me too. Um, and he'll help me to improve. Um, have you ever tried any ancient languages? So at university, I studied um, Old Icelandic or Old Norse, and um, we used to translate uh, from from Norse, uh, from Old Icelandic into English and back again. We actually studied some of the sagas for that at university. So I did an entire year, uh, year's worth of courses in Old Icelandic uh, for that. So that was the only real ancient language. I wanted to do Latin when I was at school in the UK. So I was 13 and we have to take what are called options at school. And they're the, language, they're the things that you study to sort of the end of school, right? And uh, I put down that I wanted to do Latin, but there was only me and one other student who wanted to do it. So they didn't run the class and I didn't get to study Latin. So I was really disappointed. I really wanted to study it. I thought it would have been a lot of fun. And every now and again, I toy with the idea of um, trying to learn Latin, but I'd actually love to be able to speak Latin because um, I just find it really, actually really, th really think Latin's very pretty in terms of the sound. I like the way Latin sounds and I I, I think it looks amazing. So, so yeah, one day maybe reach out to me if you want to start a Latin group. <laughs> maybe we can start learning Latin together. Um, nice to see you all too. Thank you for your lovely comments. You're also very kind. Um, Привет, как дела? Хорошо, спасибо. Но все нормально здесь. Uh, yeah, let me see if there are any other questions here that I can see on Insta. I'm sorry, I do have to go through three different places. Uh, do bear with me when I go through questions. I do try and get to them all. And uh, sometimes I miss some, and I'm sorry if I do. Uh, always feel free to write again. I will do my best. Uh, do I speak Portuguese? Yes, I do speak Portuguese. Falo português, sim. Um, estudei português na universidade. Uh, oh, agora, português de Portugal. Uh, uh, estudei português na universidade, na, na Inglaterra. Então, uh, sim. Let me see. I want to learn English. How are you? Are you want to learn English? Cool. You should definitely learn English. is a nice language. I like it. Um, 
it does get a bit everywhere, but yeah, it's a very nice language. Um, hello, hello. Nice to see you. Um, shalom, shalom. <laughs> nice to see you. Do you support? Okay, let me see. Okay, Kamara Hashiv. Ah, okay, Feskama. Feskama, Tapalev, and Hami Hamigama, and Kamara Hashiv in. That's um, my unfortunately very bad Scottish Gaelic. I started this course with Scottish Gaelic um, last year, same time I started Cornish. Um, Cornish now, if you were to ask me questions in Cornish, I could actually answer you. With Gaelic, it's not gone the same way at all. Um, the book we use is called Progressive Gaelic, and it's it's a more academically sort of positioned. So we, fo we focused a lot on how you sort of construct the language um, and a little bit less on using it to communicate. I hope to remedy that and sort of balance it out a little bit uh, so I can actually use more of my uh, my Gaelic knowledge. Unfortunately, it feels very um, feels very sort of academic. My 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 Gaelic. Um, which country was I born in? I was born in the United Kingdom. Um, let me see. What kind of religious books do you read? So um, recently, I don't really read religious books. Um, I do. I have read. Um, I have read the Bible. I've read the Quran. Um, I've read some of the Baha'i books. Um, what else? I've read bits and bobs of Buddhist literature. I actually quite enjoy listening to and hearing about uh, religion. Um, it's one of the things that religion and philosophy I find find quite interesting. Um, it's it, they're, in, they're just it's interesting topics. Um, so so yeah, but I, I, at the moment I'm not really reading anything particularly um, in that vein. Um, but I, I have uh, read uh, read them. Um, okay, let me see. Any more questions? It's nice to see you all coming. Um, let me see. Okay, I'm getting some very nice things here um, from Delhi. Okay, Abdeli I love it. Namaste, namaste. Uh, my unfortunately, my Hindi is seriously lacking. I'd love to learn Hindi at some point. Hey, um, estás? Muy bien, gracias. Muchas gracias. So you're fluent in, in more than ten languages. Let me see: Sanskrit, Hindi, uh, Marathi, Bhopuri. Um, I'm sorry, it's really small thing to see. Punjabi, English. Uh, Spanish, French, and a lot of Indian local languages. That's really cool. I love that. I met somebody on um, on Clubhouse the other day, actually, who spoke, I think it was six, not as many as your, your writing here, spoke six um, uh, in local Indian languages, and I, uh, it's, it's brilliant. Some of them were very different as well. Like he said, he mentioned he spoke Kannada and, um, and also Tamil, and as well as sort of... Uh, I think he mentioned Punjabi as well, and then he mentioned another language that I'd never heard of. Um, but he said it was a, it was a, a, a sort of a language that uh, was didn't have as many speakers, and so wasn't as well known um, outside. Even within India, it wasn't as well known. Uh, so I encouraged him to put together a proposal for the Polyglot Conference to tell us more about it because I, I love hearing more about different languages. Um, Okay, do I use any language apps like Linkq or Busu? Linkq, yes, Busu, not really. Um, I did, I, I actually talked a bit about, I have a live, that I talked about the language apps that I use and what I think about them. Uh, feel free to have a look at that and I go into a bit more detail. Um, okay, my question is, uh, do you have the ability to think in languages um, that I've learned? Um, so I don't think in any language. So my, my head is kind of just, I think of my head's in kind of feelings and uh, sights and sounds and, and images, and that's all I have. And then the language comes in when I need to need to speak. So that's kind of how that, that works for me. Um, 
I always find it quite, for me, it's quite strange to imagine thinking con all the time in a language. I, I can make myself think in a language uh, for practice. Um, sometimes my reaction might be in a language, like, for example, if something happens that sh surprises me or shocks me, it might be in a language and it tends to be the language that I'm using at that time most. Most of the time nowadays, that would be Macedonian. So I'll, I'll wake up at night sometimes and it will be a dream that's just in Macedonian uh, or it will be a, a thought or something that's happened and my, my reaction will be in Macedonian um, just because that's what's around me most. When do you feel you're fluent? Um, when can you say fluent? I, I find that a very difficult word. To, to, uh, for me personally, it's when you, there's kind of a click in your head, right? It's very difficult to define, but there's kind of a click in your head when all of the grammar that you've learned and the vocabulary comes together and it's just one thing in your mind that can then float around and learn lots of other things. And that's kind of a type of fluency for me, um, that stage. You're, you're not struggling to to communicate on on kind of pretty much all topics that would come up in daily life um, and and so you can join everything together and then learn more, more things that for me is a kind of that's a base fluency for me um, it's quite difficult though hey Daniel uh, let's see Okay, is it no, okay? Is it normal for someone to speak German and confuse uh, themselves with English words? Um, actually, German borrows very heavily from English. So, if you watch German TV nowadays, they have an awful lot of words. So, very often on TV, if you watch uh, German TV, they'll say "song" instead of "lied." Um, for some strange reason, I believe they say "die Song," and it's "das Lied" in German, um, which I find very odd. But um, you get a lot of things like that in German where they will they will just use the English word. Uh, but I don't know that's confusing it. It's just the way it is. There's another thing that they'll say as well. It's an English influence into German. So um, they'll say, macht es, es macht Sinn. Uh, it makes sense. They'll say in German, right? Um, but uh, that's an English influence. Es hat Sinn is the original word, way to say it in German. It has sense. Um, but you'll hear that in songs, you'll hear that in people will say, um, in, in, there's, there's a famous song, for example, by Xavier Naidu, and he says, Denn es macht jetzt keinen Sinn, fortzugehen, ich halte dich fest. And he sings with this macht Sinn in his lyrics, but um, hat Sinn is the, is the original uh, way of saying it. But I don't know if that's um, confusing uh, the language necessarily. I think it's the way languages change and influence each other. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm going to see if I can see any other. Um, have I studied any Celtic languages such as Welsh? Yes, Welsh, Cornish, Scottish Gaelic. Um, done a little bit of Manx and a little bit of, um, of Irish. Very small amount of, of Irish and Manx. But um, I've been studying Gaelic for the last eight months or so. Uh, same with Cornish and Welsh. And, and actually, my my ethnicity is English and Welsh. So um, my family spoke Welsh as a first language. Um, sort of from my, yeah, just my great grandparents' generation learnt English as a foreign language or a second language, should I say. Um, uh, é fascinante. Sim, é muito fascinante. Eu gosto muito de breve também. Uh, have you uh, have you tried Swahili? No, do you know what? I haven't. I would like to at some point though. I think it would be quite cool. Oh, unfortunately, I can't read the Korean script on um, on Instagram on my phone. It's too small. Um, it's just a bit too small for me. So sorry. Um, I do my best, but it's. I can't, I can't make it out. I'm sorry, it's too small. Um, do you ever forget any languages? Yes, of course. Uh, forgotten. I've forgotten more than I know. <laughs> um, let me see. Uh, excellent Portuguese, obrigado. Uh, I'm, you're also from Chester. Lovely. 
Um, I went to a number of different schools actually, uh, in Chester, many, many years ago, but um, actually the school I went to now no longer exists uh, in Chester. Do you speak Portuguese? It's, okay. Is it hard? Is Portuguese harder than Spanish? Yes. The reason it's harder than Spanish is because you have more subjunctive forms. You also um, conjugate the infinitive. So it makes Portuguese harder than Spanish as kind of a, if you're comparing both languages. There's more grammar to learn in, in Portuguese. Um, uh, okay. I'm just trying to see if I can see any more questions. And then I have to wrap up because we've got to an hour. And let's see, I don't, do I speak Arabic? Unfortunately, I don't speak Arabic very well. I studied it three times and not got to a point where I was uh, doing very well with it. Um, Kate, lovely to see you, Kate. Um, let me see, uh, you're moving to a new apartment and you want to set it up to facilitate language learnings. Do you and listeners have tips for polyglot home uh, uh, deco? Oh, wow. Lots of bookshelves with lots of books. And um, probably some screens where you can sort of tap and listen to radio from around the world. And uh, like like Radio Garden, have that on tap. And um, some internet TV stations and things, that'd be super cool. Um, and then maybe just make some cool signs in different languages, that'd be quite cool too. Um, Post-its all over the place. Label everything in the languages you're learning. Uh, all these kind of cool stuff that you can do in an apartment. Um, have you the ex experienced the ability to surge in a language, uh, to reawaken dormant languages in a couple of days or a couple of weeks? Yes and no. So I, I did this with Latvian, uh, where it kind of went back. And then I, I, I sort of listened to it for a bit, and it, the words stopped flooding back into my head normally after I've walked away from the person I failed to speak Latvian into. Um, similar thing happened with, um, with Indonesian. Uh, I didn't speak it for years, and then I started learning it again and sort of reawakening my Indonesian at the start of the COVID pandemic. And, and now I can, I can make sense of Indonesian again, which is cool. Um, but yeah, Cześć, um, Wojtek, Jekszymasz. Thing with German as an English speaker is that it's so difficult, uh, but it's just difficult enough uh, to trip trip one up. Yeah, it, it can be a funny thing, German, uh, but it's a cool language to learn. I've really enjoyed learning it. It's my favorite language in terms of my my memories of being in Germany. I've really enjoyed it. It's da dazong. Okay, dazong. Danke. Ich wusste, dass es eigentlich nicht das ist, was es eigentlich sein soll, oder? Ich meine, das Song wäre vielleicht, für mich persönlich ist es, ja, hat das mehr Sinn, <lacht> macht das mehr Sinn, was man <lacht> sagen will. Ähm, ja, der Song, genau. Jetzt, wenn als du es so sagst, ja, okay. Ähm, aber das war ein Wort eigentlich, das man eigentlich nie sagt, da, als ich da in, damals in Deutschland war. Also jetzt mittlerweile haben sie so mehr Englisch da im Fernsehen und deshalb finde ich das für mich persönlich sehr, sehr komisch. Naja, ähm, hast du eine Methode, um Deutsch zu lernen? Das braucht, dann brauche ich dann vielleicht ein bisschen mehr Zeit dafür, um alles zu er erklären, wie ich das mache, wie ich das gemacht habe. Ähm, aber vielen Dank. Bist du zweisprachig? Nein, eigentlich nicht. Ähm, ich bin ja nur mit Englisch aufgewachsen, ähm, aber Ah ja, Englisch ist meine Muttersprache natürlich. Und dann habe ich Walisisch dann ähm, nachher gelernt. Ähm, Walisische Wörter haben wir schon auf, auf Englisch in unserer Familie gehabt. Also weil wir eigentlich aus Wales äh, kommen. Ähm, aber wir haben die Sprache als Sprache so richtig mit Grammatik und so, haben wir nicht gesprochen. Ähm, ja, leider. Äh, okay. Thank you very, very much everyone for joining me and I will look I look forward to seeing you next week here to talk more about languages see you all soon take care